Okay, we're going to continue in the fifth chapter of the book of Acts. So let's pick up. We're going to pick up our reading in the 12th verse of chapter number 5. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. There's that phrase, one accord, unity. We just dealt with that, chapter 4, the unity of the church. The unity was that they had all things in common. They brought stuff together. They met the needs of those who had needs. They were willing to sacrifice of themselves so that others uh, that others would have what they needed. And then in chapter 5, we see the potential division that was created by Ananias and Sapphira in these first 11 verses of this chapter. Now, we're moving on here, and we're going to pick up our reading in verse 13. And of the rest, durst or darest no man join himself to them. But the people magnified them, and believers were the more added to the Lord. Multitudes both of men and women, insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing might overshadow some of them. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed every one. Now, that's quite a testimony, is it not? Quite a difference uh, we see here in what is uh, stated in chapter 5 and what we see in these modern-day healing meetings when people are brought up and many, most of the people leave just the way they showed up. Remember back in chapter number 3, the paralytic, it was an immediate, immediate healing. He wasn't even expecting to be healed. He didn't even ask to be healed. He was healed immediately. It says that he leaped, he walked, he praised God. He had been a paralytic for 40 years. That's a miracle. Those are the kind of miracles that the disciples, the apostles, were given authority to do. Way back in the 10th chapter of the book of Matthew, the first chapter, Eight verses of that chapter will chronicle that. So here we are. We see uh, uh, the church is on a roll. When I say the church, this early church, which I believe, and this is arguable, began on the day of Pentecost. It's as good a place to, to uh, designate as the beginning of the church as we understand it as any. But it was largely the preaching and the ministry was largely directed at Israel, Jews, who had crucified their Messiah. And that's going to change as time goes on. Peter, we see the focal point, as we've mentioned before, the focal point or the focal person of these first 12 chapters is Peter. From chapter 13 to the end of the book of Acts, it becomes Paul the apostle. And we see that the uh, preaching of Paul and Barnabas and others, they go into, literally go into all the world to preach the gospel, the then known world. So we've read through, we see the uh, terminology signs and wonders. Again, signs and wonders were, uh, took place to validate the ministry of the disciples. They didn't have a Bible. They didn't have a text. They didn't have a New Testament to say, look at what Jesus said. Look over here in the book of Romans. Look back here in the book of Revelation. They didn't have that. Now, they did have the Old Testament, and they often quoted from the Old Testament, again, to validate what was taking place in their personal ministry. But signs and wonders were done. Notice in verse 12, they were with one accord. Again, the unity of this early church. And the people magnified them. I said the church was on a roll. Good things were happening. In spite of the the opposition, in spite of the opposition of the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and fight in spite of the fact that uh, Ananias and Sapphira, and maybe there were other pretenders amongst them. Uh, I, I don't know that. It doesn't say that there were. But we see things that could create problems, division or opposi- in opposition. But the people were with one accord, and the people magnified them. And it says in verse 14 that believers were added, multitudes, again, 
The church is on a roll. And a multitude, they were healed, every one. Then again, we have recorded for you in the notes, Matthew chapter 10, verse number 1. This was the commission that was given by Jesus to his disciples early in his ministry when it says, And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, including Judas, I might add. Judas was part of the twelve then. He gave them, Judas, power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. And then verse 8 picks up the thought, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely ye have received, freely give. Well, we read here that the, that the persecution begins to intensify. In verse number 17, we read, Then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, <clears throat> which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection, that particular group of individuals, and laid their hands on the apostles. This is the second time that they're receiving some kind of attention from the religious authorities, laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go, stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. Now, uh, put yourself in that situation. If you got thrown in the slammer for preaching Jesus, uh, would you go out and then, <laughs> and then go right back to it? That's what they did. Boldness. They were bold. Of course, they're responding to the angel of the Lord. He said, go stand and speak in the temple. All the words of this life. Now, they did that because they were witnesses. <clears throat> witnesses. They were doing what they knew to be true. They were stating and declaring what they knew to be true. And when they heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest came, and they that were with him, and called the council together, and all the senate of the children of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came and found them not in the prison, they returned and told, saying, The prison truly found we shut with all safety, and the keepers standing without before the doors, but when we had opened, we found no man within. And when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these things, they doubted of them wherewith this would grow. Then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence for they feared the people, lest they should have been stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in his name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and tend to bring this man's blood upon us. We pick up here in uh, chapter 5, verse 17. <clears throat> Notice in your notes there, page 82, the high priest. This is uh, Annas. He's made several appearances throughout the New Testament already. Remember that the events that we're reading are very uh, proximate to the life of Christ and to the crucifixion and to the resurrection and the day of Pentecost. These are the earliest days of the church. So the characters that we're reading about, although we're reading history right now, this is very compressed. This is a uh, just a brief period of time from the birth of Christ uh, before his three-year ministry to the time that we're reading the birth of the church as we understand it here in this fifth chapter. We've also made reference to the Sadducees in chapter 23, verse 8. The Bible tells us that the Sadducees say there is no resurrection. They were really offended at the message of Peter and the disciples. They just didn't believe in it. They were elitists, liberal in their theology, <clears throat> probably well-to-do financially. There are people like this today, certainly in our world. 
the angel of the Lord. This could be, and oftentimes in Scripture, is an appearance of the Lord himself, a pre-incarnate appearance of the second person of the Trinity, what we call the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, then verse tw number 20, it says, go stand and speak at the temple. So the angel told them to go and <laughs> be witnesses, witnesses over and over again, and they were to declare all the words of this life. They weren't to keep anything back. They were to tell it as it had been shared and related to them. When they heard that, they entered into the temple and taught, verse 21 says. They were obedient, they did, and they taught, verse 21 of chapter 5, 25, 28, 41. So that was uh, very much part of the uh, early church ministry, was witnessing and teaching the truths that, uh, to those who would sit and listen to what they had to say. They doubted of them whereunto this would grow. So the officials, verse 42, the officials are concerned, or verse 24, excuse me, the officials are concerned that, you know, the cat <laughs> is out of the bag here, and they are, the church is on a roll, and they are not ignorant of this. They see a larger group of people growing every day, of people who are buying into this Jesus stuff, to his resurrection, to the preaching, to the ministry, all verified by signs and wonders. And they're thinking, this is getting out of hand. They didn't know where it would go. Although they knew, they knew this, if it continues to grow the way it's growing now, uh, we're going to be found out. We're going to be in trouble. The religious leaders were concerned that public opinion might rise or might grow against them, and rightly so. And they were accused, in verse 28, of filling Jerusalem with their doctrine. Whether this was actually true, the fact is that what they were preaching was very well known, filled. Does that mean that every individual knew the whole story? Probably not. But at the same time, it was common knowledge. The crucifixion of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, or supposed resurrection of Christ, the things that took place at Pentecost, the preaching of Peter in chapter 2 and chapter 3 to the nation of Israel, the uh, paralytic, the healing of the paralytic, and even what happened to Ananias and Sapphira. Probably word got out about that. You don't mess with those people. In fact, you might not want to belong to that group of people because they have very high standards like absolute honesty and truth or you may die. Whether this is an exaggeration or not, I don't know, but the apostles were accused of filling Jerusalem with the doctrine of Christ. Again, that's the central point. Jesus, 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 it's all about him. Did we not, did not we straightly command you that you should not teach? They're reminded that they were told to shut up. Well, that didn't get a whole lot of results, did it? So Peter declares then, one of the most powerful verses in all of the New Testament for us as New Testament Christians to identify with Peter's statement here. It says, Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his, you guessed it, witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. We ought to obey God rather than men. This is one of the truest and boldest statements in all of Scripture. Remember what the angel of the Lord instructed them to do. Stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. That's what witnesses are to do. The apostles were challenging these men to do to them what they had done to Jesus. Silence us. We know how you handled Jesus. You crucified him. We're not going to shut up. 
We're going to continue to be faithful witnesses because we ought to obey God's commands rather than your expectations or preferences. So you are going to have to deal with us. What follows in the next three verses is a sermon, basically. God raised up Jesus. Here's the principal points. You slew him and hanged him. God exalted him. He's the prince and the savior. He came to give repentance and forgiveness, and we are his witnesses. Boy, an awful lot of truth, of doctrinal truth and statements are given in verses 30, 31, and 32. Verse 33, we read, when they heard that they were when they heard that they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. And in other words, they didn't receive this well. They were cut to the heart. They were deeply upset. Then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee. Paul the apostle was a Pharisee, like Gamaliel is a Pharisee. In fact, Paul was a student. He sat at the feet of Gamaliel. He learned what he knew from this man, Gamaliel, that's spoken of in 534. So Gamaliel rises up. He's a doctor of the law, had in reputation among all the people, and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space. Get these guys out of here. I want to talk to you for a second, but I don't want to talk to you with them present. I don't want them to hear what I have to say. And he said unto the religious leaders these words, You men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what ye intend to do as touching these men. This is a touchy set of circumstances. They are on a roll. They have a lot of people subscribing to their beliefs. They are well known. They have filled Jerusalem with their doctrine. And you better be careful how you deal with them. This might cause a backlash against you. That's what Gamaliel is thinking. What are the consequences? What are the options? And what are the consequences of those options. So then he says something to them to consider. For before these days rose up Thutis, boasting himself to be somebody, to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves, who was slain, and all, as many as obeyed him, were scattered and brought to naught. So this isn't the first time that we've had an individual who tried to you know, bring about, a, a, a gather a group of people to come alongside him and to follow him as a leader, this Jesus guy. And he's obviously been more successful than Thutis was. But let's use Thutis as an example. What happened to Thutis? Well, it didn't work out very well for Thutis, and it didn't work out very well for his disciples or those who had followed him. They were brought to naught. <clears throat> After this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing, in the days of the taxing, and drew away much people after him. He also perished, and all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. Verse 37. Verse number 38 says, And now I say unto you, Refrain from these men, and let them alone. For if this counsel or this work of men, that is, the truths that they purportedly are teaching, if this is a work of men, it will come to naught. But if it's of God, ye cannot overthrow it. You understand? You understand? If this is the real deal, if God's really behind this, you're not going to overthrow it. But if this is just another thudis, or another Judas, or whatever, then it'll run its course, it'll go through a cycle, and it will die out. But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, verse 39, lest haply ye be found even to fight against God. And to him they agreed. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them, <laughs> beaten them, just to send a message, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus, and let them go. 
threatenings, beatings, all part of the resistance against the gospel of Jesus Christ. But in the end, they had to let them go. They had to let them go. They took counsel to slay them. They wanted to get rid of them. They wanted to eliminate them. 533, 34, we see Gamaliel. As I mentioned, he was a teacher of Paul in Acts chapter 22. Again, we're still, still dealing with the nation of Israel. This is important. Now, again, this is a book of transition. We're going to move from Israel. This is the focal point right now. We're getting to the place where Stephen is stoned in the seventh chapter. And in that chapter, there is a man named Saul that is introduced. He's going to become the chief character from chapter 13 to the end of the book. But the gospel is going to be moving from this central location, Jerusalem, which it occupies right now. It is going to go to Judea, to Samaria, and then in chapter 13 to the uttermost part of the earth in the ministry of Paul. Uh, Paul and Barnabas as their commission by that church. So, let's look at verse 41 and 42. The apostles show their persistence. In Acts 5, 41, And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. It's nice to be recognized that you are a witness. That's not a bad thing. There's kind of a, um, a sense about us, it's a pride thing to some degree, we're afraid we might be discovered to be witnesses of Jesus, and um, that's a very human thing. It's not a very spiritual thing. But sometimes people are embarrassed to be Christians, and it's probably because they haven't really embrace Christianity the way they should. Maybe they don't even embrace Christianity. Maybe they're, they make professions without true possessions. But true possession, that is someone who is truly born again, is not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Paul said it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. We are not trying to hide our Christianity. That's exactly the opposite of what we have been called to do. We have been called to be witnesses, not secret service Christians. Secret people who kind of move in and out of places and drop a track in a bathroom or send a tape anonymously to Uncle Tony who lives in Minnesota or things like that. It's okay. In fact, it's right. In fact, it's really right to be discovered that you are a witness of Jesus Christ and not to be ashamed of him. Verse 41 says, And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name, and daily in the temple, you can see how obedient they were to the scribes and Pharisees, and daily in the temple, in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. We ought to obey God rather than men. That was the statement in verse number 29. This sounds so right to the Christian ear. No debate, no questions. However, this is much more easily accepted to be true than practiced. It goes without saying that to obey someone requires that you hear what they are saying. It is a little arrogant on our part to assume that we know what one says or is saying without hearing him. We live in a culture and a world in which there exists many competing voices. The many, the, we ought to pay close attention to these statements, technological advances that we have enjoyed in the last hundred years have enabled us to hear many, many more voices. It stands to reason that the person or medium that we hear the most quite likely will have the most influence on us. It might be enlightening for each of us to take a little inventory or an audit. What do you read? How much? What do you listen to? What do you watch? What technologies do you use? How often do you ever just think or meditate about spiritual things, about Scripture? 
texting, Facebook, tweeting, all of these things are competing media. They get our attention. They take us away from Scripture. Now, I mean, you can use your iPad, and you can use your computer, and you can have your Bible text on there, but is that how you use your iPad? How you use your computer? Is that how you use your phone? Read your Bible when you have a few moments? Or do you spend an average of five hours a day, like so many people do, on their telephone, watching YouTube and communicating with your friends on Facebook and things like that? It's difficult to obey the voice when you don't hear the voice. I've given you some things here in your notes about some books that I've read in times past. I have no intention of reading them to you, but I've picked out some of the important statements from the flyleafs of these, these books that give you the intended purpose for them. I like uh, on page 86, if you'll turn there, and we're going to wrap things up here for the day very, very shortly, maybe five minutes or less. The vanishing word, the back cover of that, is image everything? For many people in our culture, image and images are everything. Americans spend hours watching television, but rarely finish a good book. Words are quickly losing their appeal. Arthur Hunt, who is the author of The Vanishing Words, sees this trend as a direct assault on Christianity. He warns that by exalting visual image, imagery, we risk becoming mindless pagans. Our thirst for images has dulled our minds so that we lack the biblical and mental defenses we need to resist pagan influences. This is a good book. I recommend you get a copy and read this. What about paganism? Hunt contends that it never died in modern Western culture. Image-based media just brought it to the surface again. Sex, violence, celebrity worship abound in our culture, driving a mass media frenzy reminiscent of pagan idolatry. This book is a clear warning that the church is being cut off from its word-based heritage. Whatever became of reading books? When's the last time you read a book? How about a 300-page? How about a 200-page book from cover to cover? When's the last time you did that? When's the last time you read your Bible from cover to cover? This book, that is The Vanishing Word, is a clear warning that the church is being cut off from its word-based heritage and that we are open to abuse by those who exploit the image but neglect the word. Thoughtful readers will find this a challenging call to be critical about the images bombarding our senses and to affirm that the word is everything. You cannot or will not obey what you do not hear. The deaths of Ananias and Sapphira were a grim reminder that the enemy and obstacles of the church were also within. And then there's a list at the bottom of page 86. You can read it for yourself. We obey man when we, and we've given you several examples, when we obey men rather than God. Watch what you read. Watch what you watch. Be careful of what you put into your mind. If you're going to think like Jesus, you're going to have to spend time being filled with the Spirit of God, letting the words of Christ dwell in you richly, richly, to be the type of uh, Christian and to be the type of person, to be the type of witness that we ought to be. When we come back, we'll go to Acts chapter number 6.